Well, welcome everyone uh, to the East Side Freedom Library in this very special event um, with our neighbor, East Sider, Kalkalia Yang. Um, we're thrilled to have her here, and it's great to have this front row uh, of, of young folks here with us, too. Um, there are restrooms downstairs. Uh, hopefully, you've signed our <laughs> guest book. Um, if this is your first time here, I just want to say very briefly um, that um, we've just passed our fifth anniversary here, and our, our focus is on bringing together the resources and creating the space and the opportunities <clears throat> for different communities here on the east side to share their stories with each other. Um, we are honored to be the home of the Long Archives, which is an independently directed and curated uh, nonprofit and includes these books back here in many languages. Um, 2000 Pan Dao in um, archival boxes downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been looking for the 7,200 Hmong business cards. Uh, <laughs> and and we're, we're just waiting for the right researcher uh, to come along. Um, a lot of the work that we do here with the books and resources is mentoring young people who do History Day projects. And so if you have young people in your family, uh, keep us in mind. Uh, we work with more than 100 kids a year. Uh, we have workshops here on Saturdays, a great group of retired teachers, college interns, great mix. Um, so send them to us so that they can do great work in History Day. Uh, this year's theme for History Day is Breaking Barriers, um, kind of tailor-made for the, the kind of resources we have. I want to mention that uh, Sarah is here from Subtext Books, and uh, there are books for sale, not only A Map into the World, but also uh, Kalia's The Late Homecomer and The Song Poet. Um, later this fall, or in December, we'll be doing an event uh, with Kalia and Shannon Gibney around their new book collection of essays uh, by women of color about the experiences of losing children. Um, it's a really great path-breaking book. Um, I also want to mention that Jenny Coops is here from Regions Hospital. Um, she's working on a project dealing with traumatic brain injury and is trying to survey people in the community. You do not need to have had a traumatic brain injury to sign on with Jenny, but it's in part to anticipate people in their families um, who may feel challenged and how the families can respond. So she's back there at the table. And after the event is over, um, Kalia will sign books. Um, it's great to see so many of you having already gotten the book. So um, I think that's it from me. Sarah, anything you want to say? Give a shout out from Subtext Books, our favorite bookstore, downtown St. Paul. Um, I don't have much to add, but I just want to say, Kalia, we are so thrilled to be here for you tonight, and we're happy to do anything for you. You are a true gem of a person, and we're so happy to know you and work with you. So, yes. Thank you. Hello, beautiful people. Can you all hear me? Yes. I'm delighted to be here. I don't know if many of you know, but this used to be the... St. Paul Public, uh, St. Paul Public Library, the east side one, the Arlington Hills one. It was my childhood library. And that's where the children's sections were. So I, I, I used to sit there combing through those shelves. So in many ways, um, this is the right place for this book to launch from. Um, where do I start? I was six and a half when my family came here as refugees of war. When we came, I was tested, and all I knew was A, B, and C. A, B, and C, that was it, that was all. But soon, like a few months after we came, the book mobile, we discovered the book mobile, my older sister, Dala, and I. And we, we, had, we made St. Paul Public Library cards. 
and we would go to the bookstores, uh, to the bookmobile and check out books. We come back home, and because we did not have a VCR, Dawa would sit there and be the human VCR for me. She would use the images from the books and make movies out of them, movies that I would, I would recognize, movies that had something to, to do with the life we lived and the people who loved us. And so I've grown up with a deep love of books. But my grandmother, who had never gone to school, who did not know how to read or write, um, when she asked me what the library was, I said it was this place to help the stories of a bigger world. And my grandma was quiet for a moment, and then she asked, are there stories like mine? And I've been looking for a long, long time. For those of you who know my work, you know that I'm the author of The Late Homecomer and The Song Poet. This is my debut children's book. I never thought I would do a children's book. I, I like to read them. And then I had children, and I read a lot of them. But sometimes we become the things that we, we believe we become the people we believe are necessary. I'm 38 years old, I'm not that old yet, but in terms of long literature, I'm like a grandma, the young ones remind me, regularly via email. The high schoolers and the college students remind me of a long story in a children's book, in a beautifully illustrated long children's book. And so in many ways, this is my dream happening. And this then feels like a dream moment. Usually I have no problems improvising, you know, speaking, but today it's a little hard because I've waited so long for this book. Because at home there's a little girl with gray green eyes who has to declare to the world that she is long before they can recognize the longness inside of her. And when she saw this book, she said, Mommy, Mommy, look, it's a long girl like me. Look at the skirt. It's a long skirt. But she goes, nobody else would know this. <laughs> no. When she flipped through the book, she came to this page. And she says, look at that rug, Mommy. That's a mall rug, but nobody's going to know this. You know? So embedded in this book are little gifts for the children, for the child I was, perhaps, desperately yearning to see. I'm going um, to read from a map into the world, and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, open up for questions, and we'll take a few of them. I hope this front row has good questions for me. Um, <laughs> But Peter and Beth, thank you for opening your door to, to this story and so many others like it. You're dear friends and mentors, and I feel so blessed to share the East Side with so many good people. It was rainy today, so I didn't know if anybody would come. <laughs> Facebook says some 800 people are interested. <laughs> 100 of those are my cousins. <laughs> and they don't come, but they're very encouraging. <laughs> But thank you for walking through the gray skies and the drizzles to be here with me. So we introduce into the world a map into the world. And I want to, before I get into the reading, I want to uh, make note of the, um, the acknowledgments. This book is for Bob who loved Ruth. Bob is a real man. He's my neighbor. And the story is very much inspired by real life. Um, Bob is 92 years old, and he didn't believe that he would live to see this book come to print. So I've been trying to fight against his help. Thankfully, Bob has wonderful help. Um, so the first copy of the press we delivered to him, my editor Carol Hins and I, and it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. But this is interesting because my illustrator is a Korean American woman, and her husband's Aaron, named Aaron, so is mine. My husband's also named Aaron. And so she, her dedication is to my family and Aaron with love. The moment my husband saw the dedication, there were tears in his eyes, people. <laughs> he said to Aaron, and I said, no, honey, read it again. <laughs> and so he had to read it again, and then he saw that SK is not my initial. <laughs> um, so A Map into the World by Kao Kalia Yang, illustrated by Seo Kim. The first time we saw the swing and the slide in the garden of the greenhouse with the big windows, my mother sat down in a chair in the backyard and said she did not want to get up. Then Bai and I looked at the garden and she pointed out tomatoes, green beans, and a watermelon round as my mother's belly. Then Bai knelt down to touch the dirt. I asked my mother if I could try the swing, and she said, yes, but no. The greenhouse became our house. 
I hope that by hang the special story cloth about how the mom got to America on the empty wall by the big window of the living room. Later, my mother and father brought me, oh, excuse me. See, I'm new at this. <laughs> we saw an old man and woman through the window. They waved, we waved back. Later, my mother and father brought me across the street. The old man's name was Bob and the old woman's name was Ruth. Up close, I could see that they were even older than Bethai. Bethai and I were in the garden picking tomatoes and beans and checking on the watermelon when my parents brought my baby brothers home from the hospital. I ran to the gate. The boys were smaller than my baby dolls, but cuter than any doll with their fuzzy heads and red lips and round brown eyes. Some days the babies cried very loud. I covered my ears with my hands and I asked my father to take me outside. Bob and Ruth sat on their special bench. We waved back and forth. The leaves of the two ginkgo trees by Bob and Ruth's house turned yellow like apricots. One day a brisk wind blew and the fan-shaped leaves came flying down. They covered the grass and the street and the dark mouth of the train. Bob raked while Ruth sat and watched. I brought in a leaf for the babies to touch, but my mother said, they're still too little, but all. The snow made the world quiet around us. We stopped seeing Bob and Ruth outside. The snowflakes fell on their driveway, glittered in the gray light. I made a ball of snow for my brothers, but it melted before they woke up from their nap. At night, I looked out our big window in Bob and Ruth's house to see their lights shining across the dark street. Sometimes I saw a shape of a person looking back at me. I waved, but the shadow person never waved back. <coughs> On a cold morning, cars came to our block, filling the street. Car doors slammed as men and women in thick jackets walked quickly to Bob and Ruth's house. My father said, Ruth has died. Her family is coming to say goodbye. I felt sad for Ruth. My brothers just played with the toys above them. The cars kept coming and going the next day and the next. I swayed back and forth on my toes by the big window. I tried to lift one of my brothers so the people could see how cute he was, but he cried. And my mother said, you're still too little to carry him, but all. After the long new year, my baby brothers learned how to sit on their own, and we all sat looking out the window together. I clapped for them when a plane flew across the high skies. They laughed every time. The house across the street looked empty. The ginkgo trees reached for the sky with their thin fingers. When the snow started melting, I could not wait to return to the swing and the slide and the garden. My baby brothers crawled all over the floor, underneath the tables and the chairs. They were like puppies, their tongues licking everything. <coughs> I found the first warm of spring on the sidewalk, and I named her Annette. <laughs> I wanted to bring her inside so my brothers could watch her wiggle, but my mother said, I don't think so, but no. The world became green again, and finally we all went outside. By buying planted green onions, I picked flowers from the lilac bushes for my brothers to smell. They opened their mouths and tried to eat them. My mother said, don't let them eat the flowers, but no. We took the babies outside again the next day after lunch. Bob's garage door opened, and we all watched as he pushed out his special bench. He sat down alone. I pulled on my mother's sleeve until she looked at me. I whispered an idea in her ear. My mother and I crossed the street and walked over to Bob. I let the sidewalk chalk bucket swing in my hands. I asked my mother to ask Bob if I could draw on his driveway. I said, if he doesn't like it, the rain will come and wash it away. Bob nodded and said, go ahead. My mother and Bob talked in low voices. I could hear Bob say, Ruth, she was with me for 60 years. I started my picture with a teardrop. 
and then I made a splatter like sunshine. I drew lines leading away from the splattered sun in many directions. I drew a line that led to the garden, there I put a yellow ginkgo leaf. I drew a line that led to the grass, there I made the sparkling snow. I drew a line to the sidewalk, there I put a smiling worm named Annette. I drew an arrow to our house, there I added my last flowers. And then I drew a line, the biggest line of all, toward the street, and there I drew the whole world. When I was done, I walked quietly to my mother and to Bob. They stopped talking and Bob shook my hand. What did you draw for me? He asked. I said in a whisper, a map into the world, just in case you need it. Bob said, I think I might. Thank you. The launch of this book is not simply the launch of a book, it's a launch of my career in children's literature. There are other books coming. Every book that I write is a love letter, and this is no different. After Ruth died, Bob was often lonely. He would sit out there on that bench, and every person that would sit by him, he would call us all angels. And one day, the little kids saw Bob weeping, because he said that in the family that we were growing, he could see Ruth in him in the very beginnings of it all. And so they said, Mommy, can we go and draw a picture? And I'm like, okay, go ahead, if Bob thinks it's okay. And they had drawn this map into the world. And I looked at Bob because I thought it was so beautiful and he was so tremendously moved. I said, Bob, what if we make this a children's book? He's like, no, I'm just a weed. Don't try to turn a flower out of me. <laughs> But we had an event at the Minnesota Children's Museum, and Bob was there. And Bob dressed, he dressed up, and all his children were there. And he just wept. And after the event, Bob came to me and he said, you helped me drive the sorrow away. And so, in many ways, this is a love letter to Bob. It's also to all of the children who collect the beautiful things in their life. Because whether you know it or not, those beautiful things, those parts of your world that glitter and shine, there are maps for all of us in our moments of despair and sorrow. I think it's such a powerful thing to have, particularly in this case, a mall girl who grows up with the tradition of the story club, who is not afraid to draw her own in the landscape of America. So often, when a writer like me writes, people want to hear only the story of our coming. So often, unconsciously, even with good intentions, uh, they communicate to us that the story of our lives here don't matter as much. So for all of these young ones, this is your world. These are your times. This book is for all of you. Thank you for coming out. Um, you can ask me anything you want, and I'll, and I'll try my very best to, to articulate what is in this beating heart of mine, because my heart's racing. <laughs> I just came back from a trip to BYU where I spoke to 10,000 students and faculty and staff. It was my biggest audience, and my heart is racing much faster right now. <laughs> is there anything anybody would like to know? This is the first literarily published book by a Hmong American author about a Hmong American family. You know, there's been books put forth by uh, organizations, but this is the first literally published one. And so in many ways, we're making quiet history right here on the east side of St. Paul. Fresno is looking. They think that if this is a good book, they may be interested. Um, parts of Wisconsin have written. This book will be incorporated into the St. Paul Public Schools curriculum. All of the children from K through five in Brooklyn Center will get a copy this fall. It's, it's doing incredible work already in the hands of our wonderful educators who recognize that all of our children, no matter where they come from, they must understand that the stories that we will live, the stories that will make America great, are the ones that are coming up now. Yes? I would love to learn. I would like to learn more about the story cloths and, and what those are and 
And if you have some in your home, I do. Let's do it. I have a beautiful one in my home. Um, so the story popped a long time ago. The Hmong had a written language in China, but during the war, some an effort to enslave the Hmong. There was an effort to take away the written language, cultural genocide. Um, so the women and the girls, because we were so good with our needlework, we tried to hide our writing and our clothing. Of course, internationally now, Hmong women are known throughout the world for embroidery, all these techniques that we use. But generation after generation, and it is a language lost to flowers. So the stories all have been our way of documenting our stories. Because the history books, if you look at all the American history books being taught in the schools, they have shown again and again that history is finding without us and our stories. So the story class were our way of communicating to the world that we have lived, that we live still, and that our stories matter. And so I wanted to pay homage to that form in this book and this little girl who draws the story of her life. I wanted to show the young ones, you know, that these forms are relevant and that they come out and are expressed in different ways. Yes? All of your books are so beautiful. Um, this one, your first one for children, was it harder to write? Because you are such a beautiful wordsmith and you can tell stories so beautifully, but, but to write for children, is it different? It's such a good question. I love public libraries, clearly. Um, and I, I love libraries that um, open their doors far and wide. And so I went to do this public fundraising event for the St. Paul Public Library. And I said out loud, I want to do children's books. And I came back and later that day, there were two emails from two editors. And one of them was the fantastic, the wonderful Carol Hintz. Super smart, goes above and beyond. And she's like, what do you know about children's books? And I'm like, not very much. Um, and so I had a summer intensive with a truly talented editor. Um, and then um, she goes, is there any stories? Are there stories inside of you that you want to see? And immediately I said, yes, I want to write about Bob and Ruth and my daughter and all these children drawing on this driveway. And so we, um, Carol generously and kindly walked me through the process of the, the thinking of children. What happens when a page turns, right? As a writer of creative nonfiction, particularly for adults, I am in control of all of the images. And so learning to trust an illustrator to carry some of those images um, from my words into the world, it was all a learning effort, but a, a wonderful one. I could not imagine a better mentor, a better friend for the journey. And then this illustrator was the right one. You know, I come from a family of gardeners. I'm not a great gardener myself, people, but I have a very beautiful weedy garden. Wildflowers are just going, growing like crazy in my garden. Um, and Bob is a wonderful gardener. He has this garden that produces huge tomatoes year after year, and he's always generous with his produce. And so I knew that I needed an illustrator who would interact and, and understand this appreciation of nature. And that was Seal Kim. So it's been an incredible learning experience. This is um, one of nine children's books that are going to be coming out from me in the, in the next five years. Because one is not enough. If I've learned anything as a writer of color and a woman, I've learned that one is never enough for the work that we have to do together. Yes. I'm curious if you would ever venture into doing like a dual language because a lot of our young children don't read or write or speak in Hmong anymore. Is that something that you would want to introduce? To you? I, I would love to. You're asking such a such a pragmatic and practical question. You know, in here you can see I'm introducing Zephai, my, my mother, the maternal grandmother is Zephai. I actually forgot to read it, but on the dedication page, there's a little bit of a pronunciation guide. Um, and so I, I'm slowly introducing the ideas. I think right now I have to establish my footing. And here I think you'll understand as a, as a Hmong woman, I have to establish that I can write in English and that I can write well and that I'm not just doing these books that are needed, but that I am working on the level of great art, that I'm in conversation with all of this art that has existed on these shelves forever. And so I, I'm doing that work now, but I think if there is um, demand, definitely I would love to. 
My, the book that's out in the spring from the University of Minnesota Press is called The Share of Bloom, and we will be introducing to the landscape of literary America among illustrators. You know, C. Ryder will illustrate that book. And she'll, she's done, I've seen the sketches already. You know, there's like a, a fly swatter hanging on the wall. That's very low detail, you know? But she, she gets that about, you know? And then a very young illustrator, Kapili Tao, will be illustrating another book coming from me. I don't want to go by myself, it's lonely. That's not the point of this journey. The point is to travel together. And so I'm trying to push up and raise from where I'm positioned as many Hmong illustrators and artists as I can every step of the way. And finally, after what, 15 years in pursuit of this dream, I'm at a place where I can begin to do that. And, and so, um, yeah, you're asking a very thoughtful question and I've thought about that long and hard. In the back. Oh, you can project. <laughs> this is more of a personal comment and just appreciation for you. Um, my family and I moved in next to across the street from Bob 12 years ago in the house that you live in now. You yeah. all left me a beautiful message when we moved in. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, it's really emotional for me to read this book because um, when we decided to move, um, about five or six years ago, the hardest thing for us was to tell Bob and Ruth that we had to move. Um, because when we moved in 12 years ago, they brought that special chair out in their driveway and watched us move in. <laughs> and my husband and I thought, oh, who are these people and why are they watching us? Because we're private people. But we quickly came to realize that they were um, like grandparents or parents to us and they watched our kids grow up. Um, so it was really hard when we moved, and I remember the day Bob said, Ruthie, come here, sit down. Jenna and Trevor are moving, and they were, we all cried together. Um, but in the years since then, I go and I visit Bob, and um, you know, when Ruth died, it was very, very heartbroken, and uh, we, we tried to get there as much as we could, but with our busy lives in a different city, it was hard. But um, within the last year or so, we stopped and visited, and he told us about this book. And he said, you can't, you're not going to believe this, but <coughs> Cal Kalia Yang is writing a book about, about us um, and, and their daughter. So it really touched him, and, and, and I know, like you said, he really wanted to see it published. And he's uh, got his help, but he, he's a wonderful, wonderful man, and I think this book just really represents that beauty, and I thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for taking care of him the last five, six years. Thank you so much for leaving us in such good hands. I think we live in a time and a place where we have to remember that we have to cross the streets to take care of each other, because if we don't, this idea of community means nothing. Thank you. John? Did you work with the illustrator at all, or was it kept pretty separate on this? Um, so this is this is a wonderful question. Seal is Korean American, so she didn't know how Hmong grandmas dressed. And so I had to sh sh send some of my favorite photos of the Hmong grandmas in my life. You know how do Hmong grandmas garden? There are practical things like this. Seal um, doesn't have children, and so like the scene where, where the, the little girl's carrying the little boy, she didn't know what that was like. And so Carol had her little boy lift up um, his cousin to, to, to share with Seal. So there were moments like this. I think Carol had a lot more work to do between finessing the pros and making sure, making sure things were aligned. Um, I could sit back and appreciate the art. I think she's an incredibly talented young illustrator. This is her American debut. And so it's wonderful that I get to work with, you know, a woman of color, and then I get to work with this wonderful female editor as well. It's a gift in this industry, as you know very well, John. Any of the little ones with a question before I go sign book? You all have been so good. <laughs> Anything you want to know? No? All right, well, I want to thank you all for coming out and for being here with me to celebrate this moment and the, the life of this book. Thank you. And now I will join you, sir, in the back. Yes, uh, subtext books is here.
books for sale in the back. And, uh,